I'm here at the Bechstein Foundation's collection of historical keyboard instruments. All of these are originals from the 18th and 19th centuries, and they have been restored according to the state of the art to such an extent that they are usable musical instruments for making music. It is my pleasure to take you through this collection today, and I would like to show you five of these works and through this to tell you the story of my instrument. For a long time, keyboards were on-off instruments. A note was either on or it was off. The exception was the clavichord, which offered a further degree of possibilities. Actually, the mechanism is extremely simple. A little piece of metal essentially serves as a proxy for my finger. When I hit the string with it, I make the string vibrate. Where I hit the string determines the vibrating length and thus the pitch. As you can imagine, the sound is not very loud, but the interesting thing is what I can do to modulate it. I can not only hit it harder or softer, I can also keep pushing or I can let up. When I keep pushing and when I don't, if I push in a certain way, the note will have a vibrato. These possibilities of expression made the clavichord into a favorite instrument of Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, whose music lives from the immediacy of expression, the empfindsamer Stil, as one calls it, the sensitive style.
This instrument is identical to one that Mozart had. It is a true classic and a cornerstone of historical performance practice. For us today, it represents the archetype of a forte piano. When we compare its sound to that of the modern piano, we notice that it is brighter and the attack is more complex, or one might say, more harpsichord-like. Let me back up a few steps. The idea of the forte piano is to get the best of two worlds, to have a reliable, sturdy sound while giving the player possibilities to shape it. The invention was to use a hammer to strike the string. The hammer strikes the string and bounces right off to leave the string vibrating freely. So the player does not need to babysit each note by keeping the pressure on the element, like on a clavichord. And by controlling the strike, the sound can be changed. As you can imagine, an important aspect becomes the makeup of the hammer. Here, it is a little knob of wood with a contact surface of a thin sheet of leather. The sound we hear is, to a great extent, a result of that fact. I want to show you another trick that this invention made possible. By pulling a fluffy sheet between the hammer and the string, you change the nature of the contact surface that is activated with this little knob. Even today, a great deal of what makes a piano sound good goes on right there, at the interface of hammer and string, the top millimeters of the hammer surface.
As you see, the maker of this instrument forgot to write his name on it. Before I came here, it was thought to be by Johann Andreas Stein. Thanks to some detective work, we now think that it was his student, Dulken. It was that school which was famous for what we call the Viennese action. After this piece by Haydn, I'll tell you a bit more about that.
So I was talking about the Viennese action. This is the mechanism by which the key moves the hammer. There are different solutions to the fundamental problem, which is that when the key goes down, the hammer has to move to the string with great speed and bounce off the string. When the key comes back up, the whole mechanism has to reset back to its original state to be ready for the next note. So at the beginning, the key and the hammer can be directly linked by levers. But at some point, the hammer has to become free in order to swing into the string and bounce back off, all while the key is staying down. At the time, there were two main approaches. In the so-called English mechanism, the hammer is attached with a hinge to a fixed element, and the key comes up and pushes the hammer and uh, sends it flying up into the string. In the Viennese action, however, the hammer is mounted onto the key itself, the other way around, so like this. And as the whole thing goes up, the key going down, making this part all go up, there's a little tab at the back of the hammer which gets caught on a little overhang. And when that happens, that flips the hammer up into the string. But the key, um, all the meantime, is continuing to rise. So the little tab can slip out from under this overhang, and then it's free, and just like the hammer on the other end. In essence, that is the famous Viennese action. And because the hammers are mounted this way around, they hit the string quite close to the front. Let's think about how a string vibrates. The first mode, called the fundamental, looks like this. The next one, the, called the first overtone, splits the string into two halves, vibrating in opposite directions. Two halves, then the next one, uh, the second overtone, splits it into thirds, then fourths, and so on. Every string vibration is a summation of all of these various modes. So when you hit a string in the middle, you get a lot of the first mode. But if you hit it near the end, you have a lot more of the other modes, the higher overtones. And that is what happens here, because the hammer is hitting close to the edge of the string. So you get this bright sound, colorful through its complexity. All this concerns the beginning of a note. What about the end? It's the dampers which control that. On the harpsichord, a damper is connected with the key. When the key is down, the string is free to vibrate, and when the key is up, it is smothered by the damper. But now, let me show you another invention, which 100 years later would be recognized as the soul of the piano. With this lever, I disconnect the dampers from the keys, bringing them all away from the strings. Let me show you with a piece that makes great use of this feature at our next instrument.
The history of music and the history of instruments went hand in hand. We must not forget that our culture of classical music is a product of our own modern era. Back in the classical period, people basically did not play old music. All the music they heard was written for the here and now. Thus, the modern piano in our concert halls is an instrument for which most of the music we play on it was not written for it. Perhaps because of this, we as composers have come to think of the instrument as a fixed thing, which we would learn about and use as it is. And that can be wonderful. The modern piano offers us tools to convincingly interpret pretty much all of the music of the past, thanks to the visions of generations of pianists. But here, among these wonderful works of craftsmanship, we see a world in which every instrument was a statement a proposal for shining light on new aspects of music, a new playing field for contemporary composers, just like new compositions set challenges for contemporary instrument makers. Finally, I would like to present what seems like a curiosity, but actually when we think about it, it's really a sensible idea. What if the hammers came to the strings from above? Aside from mechanical advantages, it also allows the structure to be arranged differently. The strings can go under the keyboard and thus extend all the way to here. Long strings are good for purity of sound. That's just how materials work. And we can have underneath that a larger soundboard, all in one piece, not interrupted by a gap where the hammers would have had to fit through and having such a soundboard must be good for resonance. Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> 